Hi, everyone. Um, hi, everyone. This is Ala Shaheen. I am um, uh, going to give you a talk about the neural network now. Uh, I would like to, to start by introducing myself. Uh, my name is Ala. Uh, I am a product manager. I work at the WIAC Z5 Group. Uh, I am also an active member of GDG UAE. And I am studying artificial intelligence at the Hideous West University in Dubai. You can find me on Twitter. This is my handle name. I would like to start by talking about Digital Days, Nina. Uh, so uh, these are uh, sessions that are going to be every week from Sunday to Thursday. 7 to 11 p.m. Dubai time. There are uh, a lot of live talks and sessions and workshops. So uh, I'm glad that you are guys uh, attending and I hope you can attend all the, um, the rest of the, the talks and the workshops. Uh, you can uh, get to know more information about the talks by visiting the website, uh, MENA Digital Day website, and uh, following the YouTube channel, MENA Digital Days Live. Of course, no registration is required. Um, these are the agenda for the whole uh, week. So, uh, you can see that there are a lot of uh, amazing talks and topics that are being introduced uh, through the 16 weeks. Um, you can get an attendance certificate weekly after filling the feedback form. So we appreciate um, your help if you can come to this link and uh, send us your feedback. And um, um, you can uh, join the MENA Digital Days Challenge by following MENA Digital Days uh, Challenge uh, link. Okay, so now I will start with my agenda. Today I will talk to you about the neural networks. So what are neural networks, why they are important, what's the structure and the concept, what are the famous types and applications, and um, I will show you a very simple example in terms of flow. So, in neural networks are very important concepts in artificial intelligence. They have been um, around for uh, many years. They are not new, but uh, they have been recently used uh, in the last um, 10 years because of many uh, uh, changes that happens in the computer uh, scenes that we will talk about uh, now. But uh, the main applications for a neural network are, um, among other things, classification. Okay, so we can use the, the neural network for, uh, for uh, assigning each object to a known specific class. This is an example of a classification problem. So if we have, for example, an email, and we want to classify if this email is a spam, or not spam for a, for a user, uh, we can call this a classification problem because we, we know in advance what are the classes that we want to, to classify our uh, application, uh, sorry, our email into. So we can separate the non-spam email from the spam emails and that's what's called classification. Uh, other applications for the neural networks is the clustering. So in, in clustering a problem, usually we have sets of data and we want to group them based on similarity. Uh, these could be based on different uh, features, um, but uh, usually we don't have the classes, okay? So we don't know exactly what we could expect, what are the number of the groups or types of groups that we might get. Uh, another example uh, for using a neural network is prediction. So we, we might use it to predict the future events or a predict number. So for example, uh, this is a regression problem where we, we're trying to figure out the price of a, a house in a specific uh, region, for example. Uh, this could be uh, a prediction problem because based on different features or different um, variables, we will be able to predict what the price of this house could be based on location, based on market status, et cetera. Uh, another example is uh, fun function approximation. So we could build a neural network that could generate um, output um, values for us from input data. Uh, so it can approximate uh, and give us uh, uh, an output for our uh, function. This is, could be for mathematical uh, applications. Um, 
I want to go through some uh, recent examples that have been around for, uh, for uh, a few years now. One of them is image colorization. So we've seen a lot of examples um, around us in social media and so on about images in black and white, and it turns to be, uh, you can apply certain models and it colors it for you. And uh, uh, this is actually a very interesting um, paper that has been launched, uh, has been uh, written by um, these guys here at, uh, you can follow their GitHub uh, colorization. Uh, they made this algorithm in 2015 and published the paper, and then they improved it uh, in 2017, and they called it uh, in the deep uh, interactive colorization. Uh, so it's very interesting, and I want you to, to check it out. Uh, it is actually um, based on convolutional uh, neural network. Another example is uh, using real-time visual translation. So Google recently, in 2015, launched their uh, uh, visual translation. So you can take an image of something that has um, uh, another language written on it, and you can translate it to any other language you want. So from, for example, Dutch to English, um, or any other uh, language you want. It supports 20 plus languages, and it's really fascinating, and it's built on the neural uh, networks as well. Okay, so this is also an example about gaming. So we can use a neural network to actually play games or a build agent that play games for us. Um, this is a company called DeepMind. It's very well known. Um, they build um, AlphaGo algorithm, which is a, an algorithm that has been used to beat the world master at the game Go. And they build an algorithm called DBQ Learning. So you can check here uh, what is happening. So you can see that the game is trying to win, the agent is trying to win the game, okay? But it's still, uh, it's, it's failing. So what they did is they trained uh, this agent to play the game, okay? And after 200, 400, 600 episodes of training for this agent to play the game, they figured out what are the perfect or the optimal configurations and the optimal um, and the optimal um, parameters? Okay, that uh, could be used in this neural network and so on. You can actually play the game and win. So the agent has figured out the best uh, strategy that it can be used to win the game, and and you can see now it it can win the game from very simple. Um, that it can use. So this is um, this is called game trees, and you can train your neural network to actually solve the, the game trees and uh, be able to. Of course, it can be used in different types of uh, of uh, uh, learning, such as the the reinforcement learning. But the basic is to use um, neural network. Okay, so. Um, what we are trying to understand here is, can we learn the underlying features directly from raw data? So if we have a set of images, and these images have uh, faces of people, and we try to uh, recognize these people, so we want to do faces recognition, okay? So in, in this case, we can't do this on a high-level features only. We need to build our neural network in a way that it actually can detect the features and because we are feeding the data as as images that consist of pixels okay so each input in our neural network will be able to detect low level features and then move it to the next layer and be able to construct mid level features such as constructing the eyes the nose the ears from the image and then move it to the third level or, or other levels in our neural network and be able to construct the high level uh, features in our application and be able to uh, recognize the faces. Okay, so uh, neural network have been part of um, uh, artificial intelligence for a long time. The first model for a neural network in its basic shape has been in, developed in 1943. Uh, you can see that um, the first perceptron developed was in 1958. 
Okay, and, and in 1982, Hopfield uh, artificial neural network have been uh, developed. And this is very important in neural networks because it helps uh, the agents learn and remember. So it's um, very well known in, in, in pattern recognition. Uh, in 1986, the backpropagation algorithm, which is the algorithm that used to uh, that has been used to train the, the neural network, uh, have been uh, implemented. So the, the, these rules have been there for a while, but while recently, in the last 10 years, we see this big um, big uh, shift in using uh, neural networks, especially, especially in deep learning. And neural networks are the core for deep learning. And because now we have big data, hardware, and software that's available to do that, we will be able to actually um, use it and apply it in advanced applications. Uh, ImageNet is a very famous database for images where you can find uh, many data sets that you can use to train your models, social media, Wikipedia, and the use of uh, uh, graphics processing units, reviews. And of, of course, we have uh, modern tools now that we can easily construct our neural networks and use them, such as TensorFlow, which is a free and open source um, framework for deep learning and machine learning that has been developed by Google. And uh, uh, it has been one of the top uh, frameworks to be used in, in this area. Okay, so now we will start uh, talking about the perceptron. So the perceptron is actually the, the basic block or the basic unit that um, construct a neural network. And uh, this uh, has been um, developed through observations from nature. So scientists in computer science, they were um, fascinated about how a human mind can recognize uh, and declassify things in, in life. And they wanted to study how our brain can actually um, be used to, to how, how our brain can actually recognize uh, patterns and declassify objects. And uh, by, by doing that, um, uh, by doing that, we were able to figure out what's the core uh, concepts of uh, the neural network. So uh, in our brain, there is the, the neural network, and the neural network is actually consists of neurons, okay? And the neurons are actually the basic block uh, that uh, can uh, take the input from one um, neuron to the, to the other neuron. Um, our human brain con contains around 80 to 120 billion in neurons. Like we're talking about billions. It's like a massive, a huge neural network inside our brain. And it is capable of receiving input signals from outside world, okay, and send it to another in, in neuron. So in our brain, what we can see here, if there is one neuron, should be connected to another neuron in, in another layer. So if we take a, ver a vertical section from our cortex uh, in the brain, and our brain, we will see that it consists of a layer of neurons connected with each other. And each neuron sends the signals to the next layer. Uh, and um, in, our, in our brain, sometimes each neuron sends the, the output that they get from the previous layer the next layer up to 1,000 neurons. So they propagate the value, okay, until it reached the output. The same concept have been developed, and this is what we call the artificial neural network. So as we, as we can see here, the basic blocks is the nodes, and these nodes represent our neurons, okay, and we have the input. Uh, so here we have the input layer of the source, Usually this is um, input that comes from a uh, data set that we have or any um, a problem a feature that we want to investigate. Uh, then we have the hidden layer of neurons that represents our neurons. And then we have the output layer. Of course, in more complicated the neural network, these inside the hidden layers are going to be maybe hundreds or thousands of millions of uh, a neuron, uh, neural networks, a neuron. 
Okay, so I want to show you in action how uh, a neural network is actually uh, working. Let's assume that we have uh, this simple image. It's a handwritten uh, digit number that we want to be able to recognize from this neural network. So this image is actually 28 by 28 pixels, okay? So at the end, we have 784 total number of pixels that we want to feed into our neural network. So we build our neural network in a way that has 784 inputs, and then we connect them all with the set of uh, internal layer of a neuron, and this is being connected to another set of hidden layer of a neuron, and then we have the final output. And in this uh, specific example, our output is actually a classification problem that classifies digits from zero to nine. So we have 10 outputs that we expect to receive. So I wanna show you what is happening exactly. So each time um, the neural network is reading a different number, certain nodes in the neural network is being triggered. And these trigger specific other nodes in the next layer. So not all of the nodes will be triggered. It depends on what pattern we are trying to construct. Okay. So let's just start by talking about the, the basic, uh, the basic uh, concept in our in neural network. Uh, so the perceptron is a neuron, okay? And this is a neuron uh, is being connected through the input. So uh, we have a set of inputs and we have one output we want to achieve. The set of inputs, we will call them X1 and 2 XM. We want to feed this into our neuron, uh, neuron and then be able to get the output. If we want to feed it as it is into our neuron, then we are actually not, uh, we are actually getting the same um, probability of uh, receiving all the inputs. But we don't know actually um, how our neural network is behaving, right? Because, because we don't know what inputs are going to be triggered in our application. So uh, we add here the weight. And the weight here reflects something in our brain between the neurons called the synaptic. And the synaptic uh, is... Um, is a kind of molecules in our brains that sense the, um, the data or the signals from one neuron to another. And uh, when the, the, the signal is being received by a neuron in our brain, then it will actually be triggered to be on or off based on the internal state of that neuron. And here we are going to do the same. We are giving different probabilities for our inputs and we call them weights. Okay, and usually these could be a value from zero to one or from minus one to one, depends on what problem we are trying to solve. We can define our uh, way. And uh, in order to achieve the output value here, we are doing a summation. So we multiply each input by its weight and we sum the whole values into a summation function. But in order to, to also get some randomness in our, um, case, we add a bias value. And the bias value also is a random number and usually very small. And then um, we have our output. So uh, as you can see here is the basic function that is the foundation of a, new, a neural network. But here there is something also I want to mention. We don't take the output as it is we need a trigger or we need an expression that we want to know uh, that it gives us the, the desired output that we want. And this is what we call the activation function. So uh, the activation function, if we, if we make it as it is, like a linear equation, because this is actually a linear equation, we are getting an input, we multiply it by a value. And these are linear numbers, okay? So at the end, we are getting a linear equation. But if we, if we um, want it to be a nonlinear application, or if we want to get a nonlinear output, 
then we need to apply some nonlinearity into our equation, and this is where the activation comes. Because initially, our our um, uh, line that will separate our data will be actually just a linear line that separates our data. So, okay, this is the, the, the V of K, which is our initial output. Then we apply the activation function, and then we get the final output. What type of activation function we could use? So there are actually uh, many common activation functions, and they all uh, been developed by uh, uh, so by mathematicians and uh, computer scientists, and they have tried different uh, types of uh, activation functions. There is no one um, answer that that can be used for all types of neural networks. Actually, in a neural network, we always test that we always uh, play around with parameters and the change. So it is very uh, important to use uh, activation functions that has been used for a while, and there have been uh, papers about them. And um, so one of the famous uh, uh, activation functions, sigmoid function, uh, it's a function that uh, when you apply it to your input, you get an output between 0 and 1. It can be used for um, types of a neural networks that we want to get a probability as an output. Um, even though sigmoid function has been there for a while, uh, it also has some, some issues. It is sensitive to change, um, and it, it has some uh, issues, but still it's used in many uh, applications. Uh, another, uh, another activation function, hyperbolic tangents, um, it is an it's an activation function that uh, when you apply it into your input, you get an output between minus one and one. Uh, and relo activation function. Uh, relo activation function is very easy. It's it's actually similar to the linear function, but for any value below zero, we always get zero. For any value above zero, we get the same value. So it's a linear in the positive side. So how do we use these activation functions? Uh, so we apply these activation functions here. After we get the summation, we feed forward our uh, output into the activation function, and then we get the final output. OK? Why are we going to do that to, produce, to introduce the nonlinearity? This is an example where we actually see uh, two classes of data uh, that are separated linearly. And this is what we call decision boundary. Decision boundary is where we can actually separate our data into classes in our um, dimension space. Uh, so in, in this case, our data is separable. There is no uh, looping, uh, over looping between our data, so it can be easily separable by line. But here, we can see that there is um, uh, overlapping between the two classes. And that's why we cannot uh, draw just one line or one decision boundary to separate our data or our classes. So in this type of application, we want to use a uh, different type of activation function. I want to show you this simple example. Uh, this example actually is for a very simple neural network that has one in neuron, so it's similar to the perceptron that we are trying to understand. We have here two inputs, which represent two features. Um, we could say, for example, that we want to try to predict or, or classify the students in our class. Uh, so if, if someone wants to, to classify, for example, um, if a student can pass or fail a class, we could put two uh, features as inputs. One feature could be the number of hours that the student is um, the number of hours that the student is spending uh, using their homework, um, doing their homework, and the other feature could be uh, the number of lectures they attended. Okay, these two features could be feeded into our perceptron or a neuron. And then we can get an output. And the output is going to be a line that separates our data and classify if this, user, if this uh, student actually can uh, pass this class or not. 
In this uh, specific example, I did not add an activation function. So you can see it's a very small neural network that has one layer, one neuron, and the activation function is linear. Okay, so let's play uh, this video and see what will happen. So as you can see here, uh, there is a, a blue area and an orange area, okay? And there is like a specific white line that has been drawn here. So after trying to train our data, our network on, on the data that we have, we were able to, to separate our data linearly by a line, okay? This is not an optimal in our case. Why? Because there's still points here that belongs to the array class and they have misclassified. So we want to improve our neural network. We wanted to make it better and give us more accurate results. You can see that the training loss, which is our error rate in this neural network, is very high, 0 0.4, which means like 43% of our uh, points has been misclassified, which is a high uh, percentage. Okay. Now we want to talk about uh, another uh, type advance of uh, neural network, which is the multi-layer feed-forward network. Okay. So uh, if we put too many perceptrons in one layer, and we put all our inputs to be connected with all our output layers, this is we call a uh, single-layer neural network, because all our inputs are densely connected to the output layer. Okay, so in this case, um, we can see that our output comes from all the uh, summation of all the inputs and their weight to contribute to our uh, output. In this specific example, our outputs are four classes, uh, for example, uh, four classes problem. How can we use this in TensorFlow? In TensorFlow, it's very easy. You can just import the TensorFlow, then you create your layer that represents all the nodes that you want to put in a specific layer. You can do that by calling uh, tensorflow.keras.layers.dense. We, we call it dense because it's a dense layer. All the inputs are connected to every single node in the next layer. Okay. Now, in the multi-layer neural network, in multi-layer neural network, we have two layers, okay? So we have one hidden layer that we don't see, and we have the input and the output layer. So in this specific example, we have the input layer, we have four nodes in the hidden layer, uh, four neurons, and then in the final layer, in the output layer, we have two neurons. So this is a binary problem because we're trying to classify a problem into two classes, yes or no, some or not, uh, pass or fail. So it's a two, uh, two uh, binary, uh, binary uh, problem. Uh, the same way we define it, but since we are using a multi-layer, and we have, in the future, we will add maybe more layers, so then it's sequential. We call it a sequential model because we're creating a sequential layers of nodes that's connected uh, with each other. So we call it by calling, um, we define it by calling the sequential model. Then we define it by giving it two layers. The first layer will, get, will take n nodes, and the second layer will take two nodes. If we add more and more layers in between, then we are talking about DB neural networks because this is how we are going to build more complex neural networks that can be used to do complex tasks and be able to achieve um, very difficult uh, classification or clustering of problems. So in this specific example, we have um, these input layers, first hidden layer, second layer, third layer, we can add as much as more, more layers into our uh, neural network, and then finally we get our output. So here, for example, we're talking about a problem that classifies into three uh, classes. And we can do this the same. So we can actually use the sequential model 
and we can call our uh, list of uh, of layers. And in, inside the sequential model, we define the first layer. We give number of n1 nodes. We define another dense layer, n2 nodes, and so on. And the final output could be two nodes or three nodes, depends on our uh, problem. OK, so I did another example. This example has also two features as input. And it has one hidden layer with two neurons. And uh, we get one output only. Uh, and uh, as you can see here, uh, I'm using here uh, a sigmoid activation function. OK? So we want to see what will happen when we run uh, this more advanced uh, network with better uh, activation function and with more uh, neurons and see if it's going to converge and give us the correct uh, classification or not. So as you can see, it tries to, uh, to classify the data, but still it's not being able to. Because it's not only about the activation functions. There are other, other things we want to take into consideration to be able to classify our data correctly. And this is what we are going to look into now. This is another example. I added actually another layer. So now we have two hidden layers. So the, the neural network now becomes more complex. And we have the same thing. We have two sets of inputs, OK? Three uh, neurons in the first uh, hidden layer, two neurons in the second hidden layer, and one output. So we want to know if uh, this user is going to get pass or fail, for example. or uh, yeah. So let's run this. I used here another activation function, relo activation function. And I want to show you by, by changing the activation functions and the number of nodes, how this is going to converge properly. So as you can see, it's now started to look to the data in a nonlinear method. So it starts to actually classify the data properly. So it, it tries to draw the decision boundary that classifies the data properly. We can see that the training loss or the, the error in our network is getting less and less. So this is a good uh, indication that our uh, network is actually working. Of course, we don't want it to overdo it in a way that we overfit our data. So this is one of the issues that neural networks face. That's why we want to be careful when adjusting our parameters. This is one of the issues that you might read about, uh, how to uh, avoid overfitting our data or underfitting our data. So we don't want to train our model very much in a way that it cannot be applied to any other data set, or we don't to train it enough so it doesn't respond well to our data. So as you can see here, our training loss or, or error becomes very low. It's 0 0.11, so like 10% only of the data is misclassified, which is very good. OK. So. Uh, Let's, let's see how we want uh, to actually use the neural network. How can we uh, train it? How can we use it to solve our problem? I want to start by a very simple example. Let's assume that, as I told you, we have a student that wants to pass a class. We have two embedded teachers, x1, the number of attended lectures, x2, the hours spent on the project. We have the following graph that represents our current Students. So we did a survey, we collected data, and data represented our current students, OK? So uh, the blue are past, the orange are fail. So we want to use this data to predict if a new user, a new student came to the class, and um, they actually, this is the purple student, and they did. Um, they did uh, collect another set of parameters for their features. 
Okay, so let's assume the number of attended lectures were uh, three, the number of hours spent of project four. Okay, and let's say that this is our new student. We want to classify this student to know if it's pass or fail. So what we are going to do now, we want to feed our data into the neural network. We take the, this new student information, we feed it into our network, and we get a value. Let's assume that the value that we got is 0 0.1. Okay, so what does this mean? It doesn't mean anything for us. We don't know anything about it yet. Okay, so okay, we collected the data and we know by looking to the graph, we might guess that the student might pass, but we're still not sure. And the predicted value is 0 0.1, I don't know, but maybe if the actual could be one. Okay, so uh, we we don't know enough information because we're not sure that the numbers, the parameters we added here in our neural network are correct and are going to give us the correct results or not. And this is where we want to actually uh, discuss something called the loss of our network. As we said previously in the example, we want to minimize the error rate in our uh, in our neural network. And this is what's called the, the loss function. So we want uh, to take the actual data that we received and compare it with the predicted data. So we have already the set of data for previous students, okay? We can compare it with our predicted uh, data that we achieved from this neural network, and then we will determine our error rate. If, if for example, our, our error rate is very high, like 90% or 99%. This is a problem. This means that our neural network is not actually working. It's not going to predict or classify our problem properly. So what we want to do is we want to train our neural network. We wanted to see some previous data before to let us understand the patterns. And when we do that, we will adjust our parameters in the neural network. And this is all, all what everyone is doing. So you feed your, of course, of course, if it was a supervised learning. So you have a set of data, you train your model on the set of data, and then you expose it to new data and you want to see if it can classify it or not. So the loss of our network measures the cost incurred from the incorrect prediction. And in the loss functions, um, as easy as they might seem uh, to be, they actually can be used, um, there are different functions that uh, we can use for that. Uh, two main functions that is being used widely, uh, cross entropy loss. We can apply this function using uh, tensor flow between our uh, predicted value and our actual value, and we get a probability value between zero and one. So it's a good if we want to get a probabilistic uh, value out uh, as an output. Another type of uh, loss function that we can use is very well known as well, mean squared er uh, square the error uh, loss function. Uh, it can be applied also uh, by applying it on predicted and actual value, and it will give us real number. And it can be used for grades. If we if we have a problem that uh, predicts grades of users, uh, if we are trying to do a prediction problem that uh, give us a regression uh, number. So we want to talk about training our network. Okay. So what do you mean by training our network? Our network starts with input. There's number of hidden layers and an output. Okay. And inside these layers there are weights. And these set of weights are initially being uh, given a random value, okay? So we start by giving it a random value. But after we feed the first uh, data into our network, we get value. And, and then we decide, okay, we can use the loss function that we determined from previous uh, slides, and then uh, get an, an output. And this output is going to be our error rate. Okay, so our error rate. So we have the predicted, we have the um, the actual value, then we get the error rate or the loss function. And then when we get that, we feed it back into our network. 
And this is what we call the back propagation algorithm. When we feed it back into our network, we will be able to use it to adjust our set of weights. So our goal at the end, we want to find the set of weights that can give us the lowest loss in the network, the lowest error rate uh, that we can achieve in a network. And then we will be sure somehow, like 90%, that, okay, our uh, classification problem will be correct. This is also called the gradient descent learning. Uh, I will go through just um, an example here. If you want to train a multi-layer neural network, this is actually what's happening in reality when you uh, build a new neural network and you start the training it, and then um, you want to adjust the weight. So we have this neural network. It's a multi-layer, has set of inputs, first hidden layer, second hidden layer, and output. On each set of inputs here, there are weights. So there is weight here in this layer, weight in this layer, and a weight in the final layer. We can actually represent our weights as a matrix, two-dimension matrix, or as many dimension matrix as we as we have. Uh, it's a two-dimension matrix. Why? Because uh, we want to set all our weights in one big uh, matrix, and then we can use this uh in our in our uh, equation so we know uh that while we are training the data we should adjust the weight so how do we do that we start by feeding our data the first example okay so we get the output then we compute the error here and we feed it back into our layer and we adjust the weight this is exactly how it happens. And when we adjust the weight, after the first input, we get a new weight. OK, so we use this new weight in order to be able to train it on the next input in our data. We feed the next input of data with the new weight that we adjusted, and then we check our output. And we calculate the error rate again. And we continue to, to do that until we reach a point that we are satisfied with our uh, error rate and we don't want to adjust our um, weights uh, more than that. Um, this function here represents how we are actually uh, using uh, the multiplication of the weight matrix with the input matrix here as an output. And the output here will be an input to the next function. Because here, there will be an x function here, an output from the first layer that will be multiplied by the weight matrix and also will be feeded as an input to the next layer and so on. It is a little bit complicated algorithm, the backpropagation algorithm. And actually, you don't need to train your neural network using this uh, backpropagation algorithm, but it's one of the famous and most um, used not not most used, but was the first one that the neural network has been uh, uh, implemented with. Of course, you can find many other uh, algorithms that you can train your uh, neural network with, but this is the most common one. Uh, so as I explained to you, this is the step that we use to do that. Of course, in TensorFlow, we don't uh, write these from scratch. There's already models you can just call them and they will do these steps for you just you need to understand the steps and use them properly because this is how we implement and then train the neural network so we start by feeding our inputs forward through the network okay so we feed our data and we get an output then we get the output the error at the output so we we get our outputs here we calculate the error the way that we can collect the error is already an equation that you can call in TensorFlow and use as it is. Then uh, we feed the error backwards into our input. So we feed it in the first layer, then the second layer, and the first layer, because we want to adjust the weight on all layers. This is where the back propagation algorithm gets a little bit um, difficult. Then uh, we determine the weight adjustment. We adjust the weight. Then we repeat for the next input pattern. 
We repeat this until all the errors accept acceptably small. Of course, uh, there are many ways to do the training and the adjustments of the errors. So we can do it input by input, what we call online learning. So when we get a new input, we actually adjust the learning directly. And then when we get the next input, the next input will be trained on the new adjusted weight and so on. Or we could do it in batches. Each one of these two methods have uh, their own uh, uh, issues, okay? But you can still, uh, you can still uh, read about them and see uh, the pros and cons of each uh, training uh, method. This is an example from TensorFlow. So you can import the uh, uh, TensorFlow model uh, library. Then uh, you define your weight as random values at the beginning. Then you loop through your, um, here you can loop uh, forever, or we can put a condition until our, for example, loss is um, not less than uh, 0 0.1. We can determine this based on what we want. Um, then we can, inside, uh, inside that, we can call the gradient, uh, uh, tape uh, class and define. So as we said, uh, as I told you before, the back propagation algorithm is called, is called the gradient uh, descent. And this is um, where we call it here. So we compute the loss on the weight as an error rate. Then we take this error and apply it to the gradient algorithm, which is the back propagation algorithm here. And it com computes the, the gradient and the gradient is the changes in the weight that I want to apply. Okay, so our new weights will be the previous weight minus some value, some random value we determine, learning rate multiplied by the gradient, which is the new uh, value that we computed through the gradient or the back propagation algorithm. Okay, so uh, I want just to go through um, how to, to define your uh, neural network. What are the correct steps when you want to build a neural network for the first time? Uh, it's good to start by simple steps. So it's good to start by defining simple um, hidden layers. So don't start with 10 layers or 20 layers. The more complex the neural network, the more that you cannot control it and you cannot understand what's going on because inside it's like a black box. It's very difficult to understand what's going on. So we start by defining our hidden layers. For example, how many layers we want to use, two or three layers. Uh, there are actually papers that talk about what are the good, uh, suggest uh, the good uh, numbers that you can start with, depends on your problem. Uh, then the number of nodes for each layer. You set the initial weights as random values. You set a learning rate. A learning rate is a very uh, small uh, value that we can use it as we explained here to adjust our uh, gradient, our weight. Um, and it's a small value and usually by research, it specifies a specific value so you can read about it and, and, and use it. You can define, you need to define your activation function on the node. So do you want each node, each layer in your uh, neural network to use the same activation function? or different layers will use different activation functions. It depends on what output you want to gain from each, uh, from each layer. Then after you do that, you define uh, what uh, are the loss functions you want to use to determine your error rate. Then you call your gradient descent optimizer. Then you feed forward your uh, network with the data. You compute the loss for the errors. You backpropagate the gradient of loss back into the network. And finally, you update the parameters. Um, you update your parameters. Uh, the bias the rate, sometimes we update the bias rate because it's part of the, of the weights as well. So we update all our weights. If we put it all together, uh, we can see here that we can start our model by defining a sequential. And inside the sequential, there are layers, and the layers contain the nodes. So we define the model. We called our optimizer. There are different uh, defined optimizers in uh, Keras. So you can 
go inside the, uh, the documentation and read about it and see the pros and cons of each optimizer. Then we get our, we train our model on the X data, which our set of inputs. We get the production set of uh, predicted uh, values. Then we call the gradient uh, state um, object. Then we start to compute the loss between our predicted uh, values and our actual values. We get the loss, which is the error rate. We then call the gradient uh, descent function or the backpropagation algorithm. And then we calculate our um, gradient. Our gradients are going to be the values that are we going to use in order to adjust our weights. And then we apply it. So see, all, all these things that I've been explaining it can be used very simply in, um, in using uh, TensorFlow by just calling the correct library. But it's very important to understand what's happening inside, because this is how you 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 understand, and then you build more complex uh, uh, algorithms, and then you contribute maybe science with, with um, a very good uh, algorithm. So the resources I used here, uh, there is a nice uh, machine learning crash course provided by Google. You can check uh, developers at google.com. Uh, the crash course, Introduction to Neural Networks. Um, there is a nice playground exercises there where you can, you can run the examples that I just showed you here. Uh, there is a very nice book called The Neural Networks and Learning Machine. You can check. It's a very famous book that uh, many uh, universities around the world use to teach uh, the neural network course. Yeah, uh, and that's it for me. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your time. And I hope you, you enjoyed the session. Thank you. So I will. Um, I will look through the comments now. Um, and uh, if you have uh, questions. Uh, there is one uh, question that's being uh, uh, around here. How to calculate the degree of complexity of a neural network? The complexity of a neural network is determined by um, by how many uh, hidden layers and how many neurons are we are actually using uh, in, inside our algorithm. The more we add, the more it becomes complex, and the more it will actually uh be uh, very difficult to, to not to train of course it will be more expensive to train because it will take more time um but it will also be difficult for you to understand uh, what's happening inside so you start small and then you add and experiment uh by adding of course, you need to understand your input and output, what you're trying to reach, uh, how many input features you're adding into your network, what are the, the outputs that you want to achieve, etc. Yes, adding more layers enhance the risk rate, but it slows the operation. That's that's correct, uh, and this is where we want to try and see and compromise between these two things. Also, we don't want to add very uh, too much layers in a way that we will not be able actually to 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 use this in neural network to other examples this is where the overfitting the problem comes you need to read about it it's a very important concept um the compromise comes between yeah we need to compromise the layers and and yes the training time also yeah There's a question, how do we integrate with a neural network? Oh, actually, this could be another session. It's, uh, we, could, we could actually use uh, uh, an existing model and try to solve it for another uh, problem that exists. There are a lot of resources online. You can read about the uh, different types of neural networks and try to, 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 to play around with it.
Okay, thank you. Thank you, everyone.